So this is hate mail? Yeah, yeah. Who do you think sent it? Uh, An American? A, a Brit? I have no idea. I think British. What are they accusing you of? I'm accused, I think, of being... Where is it? Human rights jihadist. And is this you being a kind of Geppetto figure? Apparently holding all of Great Britain. Oh, look, it is from Britain. It's second class. Second class. That's a little bit of an insult. He th wants to threaten you, but he's not in any great rush. <laughs> Clive Stafford Smith is the UK Legal Director of Reprieve, a non-profit organisation who represent the legal rights of people in secret prisons all around the world. He's the kind of person that cynical people call a do-gooder as an insult, but I think that's good because he's actually doing something good. In 2010, Barack Obama made a campaign promise to close Guantanamo Bay, three years later, and we're still no closer to seeing it shut. As a matter of policy, the preference of the United States is to capture terrorist suspects. When we do detain a suspect, we interrogate them. And if the suspect can be prosecuted, we decide whether to try him in a civilian court or a military commission. The glaring exception to this time-tested approach is the detention center at Guantanamo Bay. Clive has represented inmates of Guantanamo Bay since it opened in 2002. To date, he's helped release 65 prisoners and still acts for 15, including this guy, Shaka Armour. He's a British citizen who has been held in the prison since 2002, despite being cleared for release six years ago. In March 2013, Shakarama joined the hunger strike at Guantanamo Bay. Reprieve estimate that over 130 inmates are currently rejecting food, and a bunch of them are being force-fed by the American army. Some of your clients are engaged in a hunger strike at the moment. How long has that been going on? Well, I always wonder when the last time was that I didn't have food for 24 hours, let alone 48 hours, let alone now 120 days. About 120 of them went, have gone without food for four months. And of course, some of them are being force fed. Can you explain the process of force feeding? Because I think that some people hear it and they, they think of some people holding someone down and then putting like a spoon in their mouth, but it, it's not like that at all. There's a tube that's 120 centimeters long and they stick it up your nose and they force feed you through that twice a day. Instead of leaving it in for days at a time and just force feeding you through the tube, which is the easiest way to do it for the prisoners, they uh, pull it out after every single feeding. They put people in restraint chairs that look a bit like the electric chair and it's advertised by the manufacturer and it says on it, like a padded cell on wheels. And they strap you in this thing and they have a head strap and they stuff this thing up your nose and then they bend the tube over your head so you can't bite it. And then they leave you there for two hours and they force feed you and if you vomit, they carry on doing it. They won't let you go to the toilet um, while you're there so you have to uh, piss on yourself effectively. Imagine a future 10 years from now or 20 years from now when the United States of America is still holding people who have been charged with no crime on a piece of land that is not part of our country. Look at the current situation, where we are force-feeding detainees who are hold, being held on a hunger strike. Would you shut Guantanamo tomorrow? Of course I'd shut Guantanamo tomorrow. What would you do with the prisoners in there who are deemed to be an actual risk? Well, it's incredibly easy. First, there are 86 of the 166 prisoners who have been cleared for release, 52%. So we just send them back home. With the others, there's a group of people who have been designated for trial. Give them a proper trial. I don't care if they give them a proper trial in Guantanamo. They can bring the jury down there for all I care. What I was going to talk about was radicalization within Guantanamo as caused by the torture perpetrated by the American army. So you've got to love that, don't you? We have tortured them so badly that we've pissed them off, so now we can't set them free because they might be angry at us. You know, first, that's absurd and the notion that you can torture people and then hold them because you've tortured them. But second, it's also just not true. Do you believe there is a, a large terrorist threat against the West? If you had taken the entire membership of Al-Qaeda um, on 9-11, you could have put it all on one page of paper. And if you had taken the reservoir of goodwill for America on September the 12th, it would have flooded the Atlantic. And by using this whole uh, paradigm of war on terror and by jettisoning our values, what we did was we, pro we, we inspired, if you will, and I hate that word because who wants to inspire someone to go around killing innocent people? We inspired 
hundreds of people to hate us. And we drained the reservoir of goodwill to such an extent that now 90% of Pakistanis think we, the Americans, are the bad guys. How do you see the hunger strike working out? I don't know how the hunger strike's going to resolve. We've had a bunch in the past, and it's always resolved in the military basically beating them into submission. But this time, because people are so desperate, and you know, the part of the hunger strike, they're force feeding them a, a particular thing that uh, induces that. I don't think they thought about this, but it induces depression. And, you know, people like Shaka Rama have never met his 11-year-old son who was born on the day that he arrived in Guantanamo. Uh, and so why would these guys ultimately, some of them, not commit suicide? And that's the danger. I, I think people are going to die there. And I've got to say, my favorite of all the guys there is Shaka Rama. I, I told them the story about Hurricane Carter. I don't know if you remember the story with Bob Dylan and the whole song. Oh, the song, yeah. When he was banged up for something he didn't do, a murder he didn't do, he recognized that the whole prison system was about crushing him. And so he did exactly the opposite of everything they would say. So Shaka started doing the opposite of everything they said. And he had this thing where he'd go out to the little cage where they would let him do wreck which meant sort of sitting around. And he said, I want to stay here for seven days as a peaceful protest. And they said, if you do that, we'll beat you up. And so he came to this compromise where he would ask them a question every day. And if they got the question right, he'd go voluntarily. And if they didn't, he'd make them beat him up. So he began by asking them the name of the vice president. And they got that wrong, so they beat him up. But, you know, to my surprise, uh, that really reinforced Shaka's sense of self. And he came back from being immensely depressed to being in control of his life again. There are obviously a lot of other similar places to Guantanamo Bay around the world that people are less aware of. Well, Guantanamo's evil twin sister is Bagram, which is in Afghanistan. And, you know, it is an incredibly sad thing that no one does know about Bagram, but it's far worse than Guantanamo. I've never met my client. Uh, you know, I can show you his birth certificate. And it gets worse than that. And the one I can sort of vaguely talk about, because some of it's public, is the Binyam Mohammed torture, where he was taken to Morocco and a razor blade taken to his genitals and so forth. You know, if I came to you and I said, oh boy, have I got some interesting stuff on Binyam's case, you naturally want to see it, but I can't show it to you because it's secret. And that's the frustration of the secrecy story, is it's far more significant than in a way than the torture because the government's doing awful things and you can't know about them. Perhaps through the kind of success of the demonization of places like Guantanamo, then that has encouraged uh, Obama to give up with taking prisoners and just kind of start the, using drones en masse. Does that ever kind of worry you? That Oh, of course it does. I mean, when I first went to Guantanamo, one of the sort of Yahoo um, Republican people down there said, yeah, yeah, if you insist on legal rights for these terrorists, sons of bitches, we'll just kill them. And the reason Guantanamo ended up having so many innocent people in it was because we were dropping leaflets saying, if you turn this guy with a beard in, we'll give you $5,000. You know, that translates in Europe or America to about a quarter of a million dollars. People in Pakistan and Afghanistan would turn their own grandmothers in for that sort of money. And what happened in November 2011, when I was in Islamabad, is we had this meeting about drones with a bunch of the, the families of the victims from Waziristan. And it was really a great meeting where, you know, the first time they'd met a Westerner and I told them the American perspective that no innocent people were being killed and they snorted. And, you know, but we, we discussed what we could do. Three days later, the 16-year-old kid who I'd met at that meeting, Tarek Aziz, was killed. And it was because some bastard informant had stuck a GPS tag on his car. But, yeah, I mean, how does it get to a point where Obama's signing off on the death of your 16-year-old friend? It's because he's being given misinformation and they're using the same intensely flawed intelligence that resulted in Guantanamo Bay. You've kind of used this phrase a lot of people are used about us kind of sleepwalking into the drone Wait era. a minute, I said it first. Okay, you coined a phrase which has <laughs> been jumped upon. So I was very pleased with myself for that because the drone age has resonance in the stone age and uh, I just like it, I'm sorry. There are very few things I can claim. Honestly, I steal most things from others. <laughs> Now that America set the precedent that you can fly these robots around the planet executing people you don't like without anyone's permission or without any trial, well, where does that leave us with China, with Russia? 
with India in the future? I don't think it's any great secret where we're going in a way because we had dystopian movies in the 1980s and 1990s, you know, all those ones in LA where you have drones flying everywhere and, you know, we all thought, ooh, that's horrible. Well, we're well on that route and I think ultimately we will end up with some sort of international convention on it. I've got a video of the New York Police Department with their first drone, which they got for terrorism. Now, they've not had a single terrorist prosecution as a result of all of the money we poured into the NYPD. But they do have a drone, and you know what they did with it, of course? Was they spot two people making out on the roof of an apartment, and then they just go round and round them for 30 minutes watching. Now, you know, honestly, I'm not too paranoid about anything, because frankly, I know the CIA snoops on all of my emails and things because I was told by the people in the know. And, you know, my wife and I, when I go to Guantanamo, we periodically send sort of happy little notes to the CIA apologizing for being so boring, because I just don't give a damn, frankly. But I'm a very privileged person in the sense that, yeah, they come after me every now and then, but I can defend myself by and large. Um, there are a lot of people who are in much greater jeopardy than me, and those tend to be the people we hate. And that's what concerns me a lot more. I've read somewhere, I mean, Lord knows if it's true or not, but I read somewhere that, that in uh, kind of fatter areas, uh, mothers have taken to telling their children, eat your supper and go to bed or the drones will come and get you. Which said something about the kind of psychological impact that the, the presence of these robots has had. Well, there's certainly that, but actually, in a way more pernicious, what mothers really say to their children is, you can't go to school today because the drones might get you. And that's, uh, you know, when you look at who the victims are of this process, it's, you know, one can quibble if it's quibbling about, you know, who's killed and whether they're militants and whatever. What you can't quibble about is the fact that. There are 800,000 people in Waziristan who are being terrorized by these drones on a daily basis who aren't guilty of anything. But I don't know about you, I'm actually quite keen to limit the use of weapons that kill people as much as we can. And I don't care what well, they are. Well, you know, you're a pinko. I realize that. Yeah. <laughs> can you just give me my full title? A commie pinko liberal. A commie pinko liberal son of a bitch. There we go.